What it do, guys? It's your boy Dream Team Neil and your boy Dawn. We back with another reaction, guys. This was recommended to us. Yeah, I, I, I usually try to find the people. You know, when y'all send us recommendations, we got Illumined Lane. Illumined Lane. I don't know. That that look like what it says. We sorry, Illumined. You probably butchered that. I probably did. I probably <laughs> did. But <laughs> requested when Britain nuked America twice. So I don't remember this happening. I don't. Oh, so it had to be before America was America. They nuked the land or something. It had to. I be don't remember ever getting America ever being nuked. Cause they definitely didn't tell us this in the history book. So, no. <laughs> so we finna yeah. check this out. Y'all hit that subscribe button. Send down those recommendations. Let's check it out. <laughs> In the 1960s, Great Britain nuked the United States not once, oh. but twice. Dang. Way before our time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Fortunately for all concerned, the attacks were only training exercises. Mm. So embarrassing were these attacks that they were hidden from the American public for about 50 years, as well as being strenuously Jeez. denied to the American press for decades. As far as America was concerned, its defenses were 99% effective. But in simulated attacks, Royal Air Force bombers managed to penetrate U.S. airspace to launch nuclear attacks on New York City and several other important urban centers. Before I tell you how, a word from our sponsor. This episode <laughs> is brought to you by Curiosity Channel. And the sponsor is in perfect, right? D-Day. It looked like it's actually something important. <laughs> those movements from childhood to the end of his life, and D-Day hidden traces that uses archaeology to uncover what was left behind in mm. Normandy by Allied and Axis troops, from helmets to bunkers. Get unlimited access, starting at just two ninety nine a month mm. or nineteen ninety nine a year. And for my audience, the first not thirty days are completely free. If you sign up at Curiosity Ooh, Screen, 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 screen. <laughs> Mark Felton and use the promo code Mark Felton for the sign up process. Stream. Curiosity Stream, the best streaming service yeah. for lovers of history. How did the British manage to penetrate the world's most heavily defended airspace? The answer is surprisingly simple and consists of two words Avro Vulcan. Me, when my dad was in the military, they actually have like air shows, and you can walk on these, like walk in these little aircrafts and stuff. You can walk in them. Yeah, cause they, uh, I know in Fort Worth they have like little air shows, and there's different ones, and they let you walk in them and everything. Oh. I don't think they work, but they, you can you, you can walk in them. <laughs> like, let me do a little training exercise real quick. I walked in, well, I said, boy, they better not take off. <laughs> <laughs> Vulcan first flew in 1952, the team that created it led by Roy Chadwick, who had designed the famous Lancaster Heavy Bomber of World War II. A jet-powered, tailless, delta-wing, high-altitude strategic bomber, the Vulcan was the backbone of Britain's nuclear airborne deterrent during most of the Cold War, serving from 1956 until retirement in 1984. Huh. This is the story of Exercise Sky Shield, when Britain nuked its closest ally, exposing how the Soviet Union could have done the same for real. Mm. In 1960, the United States decided to run the largest test of its air defenses in history. Exercise Sky Shield 1 occurred on the 10th of September 1960, and all commercial air traffic over the US and Canada was grounded amounting to a thousand U.S. commercial flights and 700 general aviation aircraft, plus a further 31 foreign flights due to land in North America. Hmm. The U.S. Strategic Air Command would launch B-52 Strato Fortresses and B-47 Strato Jets to simulate a massive Soviet nuclear bomber force approaching <clears throat> North America from north and south. 
360 U.S. interceptor aircraft stood ready to defeat these enemy aircraft, which numbered 310. Among those 310 aircraft were eight Royal Air Force Vulcan B-2 nuclear bombers. A flight of four flew from Scotland, while the other four launched from the British territory of Bermuda in the Atlantic Ocean. The American plan was to detect these enemy bombers by radar and other early warning systems. Then they would be intercepted and destroyed in simulated attacks by US jet fighters and missile batteries. <coughs> the attacking bombers split their attacks between high and low altitude. The defending fighters did very well against the stratojets and stratofortresses, intercepting many of them, but the Vulcans proved more elusive opponents. The Vulcan flew at the highest altitude of the simulated Soviet bombers, cruising at 56,000 feet. Jeez. One was successfully oh, intercepted at this altitude over Goose Bay, Labrador, by a United wow. States Air Force F-101 Voodoo. But the other seven Vulcans all managed to penetrate American airspace to launch simulated bombing attacks on U.S. cities. God dang. They then turned around and landed at Stephenville, Newfoundland. Oh, we would've got messed up. Boy, for real. We would've been out of there, bro. We would've been knocked off the map. Man. Yeah, I <laughs> The question was, how had the Vulcan managed it? The answer oh, was the had highly advanced None of that. electronic countermeasures systems mm. and the Vulcan's amazing maneuverability. For example, the flight of four aircraft that approached from Bermuda were successful because three of them put up a wall of electronic interference and prevented mm. interception, while the fourth Vulcan carried out a simulated nuclear strike. This was all rather embarrassing for Strategic Air Command, which quickly buried all stories about British bombers having nuked U.S. targets and confidently assured the American public that U.S. air defenses were, as I said, 99% effective. However, the following year, the Americans invited the RAF to take part in Exercise Sky Shield 2. Perhaps the USAF was determined to show that the Vulcan's previous success was only a fluke, a one-time only event. Sky Shield 2, which occurred on the 14th of August 1961, was an even bigger event than the first one. It caused 2,900 US and Canadian flights to be grounded, affecting 125,000 commercial passengers. During the exercise, 125 US and British bombers were right. 1,800 fighters mm. and 250 missile sites, and over 200,000 Air Force personnel from the U.S. and Canada. I'm trying, I've been wondering where they be getting this film from. Like, who had a camera? I, I swear to God, <laughs> I, mean, I didn't even think about that at all. I'd be like, who was documenting this stuff? Huh? That's a real good question. That's a real good suspicious. Question. Do that sound suspicious? <laughs> Coming up on sixteen and a half seconds. Now continuing. Yeah, but I'm still ready. Ready. Again, eight Vulcan B-2s participated, split again into two flights. One attacking on the northern route from RAF Lossiemouth in Scotland via Canada. Oh. And the other four aircraft on a southerly route from Kindley Air Force Base Bermuda. The B-47 Stratojets simulated low-level Soviet hmm. bombers. How did they get that B-52? <laughs> oh, look, I feel like it was wrong. 42,000 feet, while the Vulcans again operated the highest altitude, 56,000 feet. 
That is At the massive Nora, or North American Air Defense Bunker at Colorado Springs, the U.S. top brass was joined by the RAF's Air Marshal Sir Kenneth Cross of Bomber Command and Sir Wallace Kyle, chief of the RAF Technical Training Command, to monitor the exercise. Just before 2 p.m., U.S. interceptors pounced on the B-52s, approaching at the mid to high altitude level. The Vulcans also came in from the north, and again, due to the Vulcans' high-tech jamming equipment, only one was shot down by an F-101 Voodoo fighter. In fact, large numbers of U.S. fighters were scrambled, but they concentrated almost exclusively on the B-52s. When the Vulcans mm -hmm. came over, the interceptors did not have sufficient fuel remaining to climb the 56,000 feet plus and engage them. The surviving three Vulcans conducted their attacks successfully, turned around and landed at Stephenville, Newfoundland. <laughs> the southern attack force of four Vulcans from Bermuda reached a position 50 miles off the U.S. coast before fighters were scrambled to intercept. Again, three of the Vulcans unleashed an electronic jamming screen that kept the attacking F-102 Delta daggers busy while the fourth aircraft crept round to the north and sneaked through. <laughs> This Vulcan proceeded sound like a good plan. Huh? It sounded like a good plan, like it was, it was like it worked, it was a good Bro, strategy. I said, we fell for it twice. <laughs> we thought, they thought the second time, they said, they ain't gonna get us again with that same move. Oh God, they probably could have got them with third, fourth, and fifth time. <laughs> you know? this no more trying to. This Vulcan Air Force Base in New York. If this had been a real attack, New York City could have been reduced to a smoking, irradiated hole in the ground. <sighs> Dang. Many of these stratojets and strato fortresses had also managed to evade interception and launch simulated nuclear attacks, but not at the kind of success rate that the Vulcans enjoyed. In two massive exercises, of eight Vulcans that attacked on each occasion, seven had got through to their targets, an astounding survival rate against the huge might of the U.S. air defenses. The Vulcans showed that with the right aircraft, America could be laid wide open to a nation-ending assault, hmm. something which the Soviet Union would have been very interested in. Fortunately, oh, sure. all concerned, the relationship between Britain and the United States never changed from special to decidedly antagonistic, and the Vulcans never came in anger. The American government also tried to make damn sure that nobody ever found out about the Vulcans' <laughs> cities. The U.S. Air Force was very quick to deny rumors that RAF planes had once again successfully penetrated U.S. airspace. In fact, the U.S. government went so far as to classify all references to Vulcans included in the Sky Shield exercises. <laughs> After all, if the RAF could practice nuke New York City, Washington, D.C., and even Chicago, the Soviets Jeez. could do the same God, if they could develop an aircraft as good as the Vulcan. <laughs> as far as Strategic Air Command was concerned, the Vulcan episodes had never happened. And the U.S. was well protected, and that protection, as I said, 99% effective. The Vulcans' successful attacks on America were only fully declassified in 1997, long oh. after the Vulcan had left British service. Many thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share, okay. and also visit my audiobook channel. Yeah, that was pretty, man. They would have got us a couple of times, no problem. Oh, everything, boy. Man, that's one of those. That's one of those history lessons. You just gotta listen. You just so interesting. You oh, just yeah. listen. Like, <laughs> Dang, what? 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 Might not be here. Uh huh. <laughs> For real, but hey, we checked that out. Y'all make sure y'all send us some more recommendations. Hit that subscribe button. That's all we have for this video, guys. We out of here.